Work besties, we've covered red flags in the workplace, but we haven't yet covered red flags in a manager or a boss, and that's what we're gonna cover today. We've all had that poor experience with potentially our manager, but also maybe we've seen someone else's manager. We have a friend or a coworker who's dealing with a lot of red flags with their manager, and you can see the impact that that has. You know how the saying goes, people don't quit companies, they quit managers. I think there's a lot of truth to that, and DDI did a study, and that study suggested that 57% of employees have left their job because they are frustrated with their manager or company leadership in general. You know, bad leaderships create poor working environments, they create lack of trust, they create friction, they create poor communication, ineffective communication, lack of recognition, the list can go on. So we're gonna get into some red flags to look out for in managers. And perhaps you're listening to this video and you're like, that's not really a red flag for me. That's okay, we all have different definitions of red flags, green flags, beige flags, but this is what I've noticed within the working world that I would identify as a potential red flag. Managers who don't lead by example, so their words and their actions completely misaligned. They say one thing, but then they do something else. They say that they care about their team and the mental health of their team, yet they create unrealistic timelines and overwork them and have crazy expectations. Make it make sense, you know? They don't offer any support or recognition. When you are assigned something and working on something, they're not available to reach out to for support. And if you do reach out to them, you're not met with something positive. You're met with, well, how do you not know how to do your job? Or go find that out yourself. Or maybe you're just ghosted because they're not available in general. Red flag. Ineffective communication, and there's so many different elements to this, but they're not transparent with things would be one thing. They sugarcoat things, they beat around the bush, they have information that they can share with you but they don't share with you and you figure that out long term, you just can't trust them if they're not an effective communicator. And this also goes down to reactive versus proactive. You know, they're reacting to things constantly, they're not getting ahead of things. If you bring something to the table as and identify, hey, this is gonna be an issue or this isn't gonna work because of this and they choose to ignore that and then that thing happens and then you're like, well, I told you so. And then they go into reactive mode. That's not overly effective bit of a red flag. They're not prepared. They lack planning with their teams. When you show up to meetings, it's very clear that they haven't prepared at all. They don't have a concrete agenda. They just kind of wing things and not in the way where it's helpful. They're micromanaging and very control driven. So you often see this in managers who just, they can't let go of things from a control perspective. And they're so far into the weeds on so many different things. And you know, there's multiple reasons for this, but it creates this lack of trust. You know, if my manager is micromanaging me and they're so far into the weeds on my work, one, I'm like, well, why did you hire me to do this in the first place? Cause you're just gonna do it yourself. But two, you don't trust me at all to work autonomously on this given thing. And I'm frustrated because we're kind of doing duplicate work here. And I'm also not feeling very valued because you're constantly hovering over me and checking my work almost. So big micromanager, lack of control, or lack of letting go of control. It comes down to this like my way or the highway mentality. It's like, do it exactly this way. I don't care if you find a better way to do it. I don't wanna listen to that. This is exactly how you do it, end of story. Big red flag for me is when you identify something to a manager, you say, oh, you know, I, I have experience in this or I've, I've done things like this in the past and potentially there's an opportunity here to reassess how we're doing this or make it more efficient and they're just like, no, we're good. Like they completely shut you down. I also realize that sometimes it's not the time or place and to change processes and or systems and whatnot. And it's but it's still received. I think from from a productive manager would be like, oh, you know, thanks for bringing that to the attention. Definitely something we can look into down the road. However, right now it's just not a priority to make that shift. But thank you for calling that out. That's great. I think it's how you're kind of met with that information or met with that scenario that identifies green flag versus red flag. But just like a, they don't care about your input whatsoever. In meetings, they're not kind of deferring to you when things come up that are within your area of expertise. Everything communication wise is very manager forward and you're just like in the back, worker B. They don't wanna hear from you, no input, whatnot. Red flag to me. Just in general, they foster a really unhealthy work environment. They call you on your time off. They expect you to be connected around the clock. They do not respect the boundaries you have in place. They overwork their teams to the point where people are you know, getting sick or not being as effective as po possible. Very unclear deadlines and timelines on things. Things are constantly being communicated 
week to week that differ from the weeks previous. I don't know if anyone has experience with this, but it's like you're working on something and it's like, oh yeah, can you just get this started? But you don't really know when it's due. And then suddenly the next week, it's like the highest priority ever. And you're like, well, why aren't you done that yet? It's like, well, when it was communicated initially, there was no timeline shared. So the urgency wasn't, you know, priority at that time for this thing. And then it's kind of like they blame everything on you versus setting clear expectations up front. It just creates such an unhealthy work environment in general. There's no opportunities for personal growth. So they aren't thinking about you or where you want to go with your career or pitching you for opportunities. They don't even really think about you at all. It's kind of just, yeah, you work for them, you get the work done and that's it. They don't have any space or priority for your own skill development to offer you those opportunities. They're very selfish with taking credit. So it's a whatever my team did, I did kind of mentality. If the company or organization is giving praise for a big project or something that just got done, suddenly their face is slapped on that as the person who succeeded and, and completed that thing without passing off recognition to their team behind the scenes that I'm sure worked very, very hard and effectively on this project, but they're irrelevant in the manager's eyes because they just want all the glory of that. So not being able to give out credit where credit is due or acknowledge that there's more people behind the scenes than you in accomplishing something, uh, that's a major red flag to me. Don't love it, don't love to see it. Especially too, I mean, it's even worse when they claim the credit is their own, when they present your work as if it's their own and say it's their own. I have seen that many, many times in my career where I know someone else did the work and they're presenting something. Actually, it happened to me. I created this entire thing in the first like couple years of my career and I watched someone present it and claim it as their own. And I was like, that's a weird, okay, weird flex, but sure. And then I'm a big believer in karma. So within minutes, people started asking a bunch of questions about this very lengthy project and presentation that I had worked very hard on. This individual couldn't answer any of the questions because uh, she didn't do the work. That was my work, little old me. When she was stumped up there in the front of this presentation room with quite, quite a large audience, I just looked at her and I thought I have two options here. I can just let us all suffer in this awkward silence. Everyone in the room by now knows that you don't know the answer to this. Or I could be the better person and I can uh, answer these questions and then regain a little bit of that credit. And that's what I did because this is what I did. So anyways, I think that when people can't acknowledge that their teams, or even in that situation, there's nothing wrong with presenting. I understand that managers and bosses sometimes present, you know, the cumulative work of their teams to larger, broader audiences. That would have been a great opportunity for her to just go, yeah, well, Laura's worked really, really hard on this and she's behind a lot of these concepts. And so let me bring her up and she can answer some of these together. Like just being able to pass the mic to someone else and being humble enough to say like, yeah, th this is a whole entire team thing. It's not just me. It doesn't take any of your like credibility away or your power away. I think it just makes at least me respect people so much more when they're able to acknowledge that there's a whole team behind them and people, regardless of the level you work at, are really skilled and effective at certain things. And so kind of just passing over the mic to say like, oh, well, let's give space and give, you know, an opportunity for someone who's really involved in this and did a lot of this work to uh, get involved in the conversation. So I'm rambling. I will refocus, Laura. A big red flag in managers and leadership to me, and I've, this is probably one of the most frustrating things I've seen or I experienced within uh, the corporate world specifically is when leaders or managers are just so into playing into politics and they're just so determined to play the game and to climb the corporate ladder no matter who it hurts on the way up or whose reputation it tarnishes. Playing into politics is so gross to me because you compromise so much of your own morals and ethics I don't know, I just, I, I've seen some really nasty moves, especially as you get higher up into leadership or executives positions, I've seen some really nasty behavior that I always wonder to myself, I'm like, after that's all said and done and they've moved on from this point in their career, are they ever gonna look back at that point in time and what they did and be proud of that? Or is it something they're just gonna forget about? I also think too, when you see people in those positions that use politics and whatever it takes to climb the ladder and get to the top, it's very lonely up there and you tend to latch on to other people who play the same games, which is very, very toxic and you can't really trust anyone. 
And it shows within their teams, the level of respect that their teams, people that work under them have for them, the turnover rates, the culture, everything. You can really, really tell who is a true leader versus who's just a boss or manager who's brought their buddy in from some company to lead this team even though they're not a very good leader and won't work well with others. So huge red flag is playing into politics, playing into the game. Another red flag that kind of goes a little bit hand in hand with that is a huge ego. And I think, I mean, we all have an ego. We all, some of us know how to manage it better than others, but some lead with decisions driven by the ego so much. And while others have an ego because we're human, it doesn't necessarily drive a lot of our decision power. I think we, there's still like a level of morals and ethics that you hold, and then you kind of challenge your ego. Like there's more of a dynamic there versus the really ego driven ones, which are just driven by power and money. And it's very, apparent when that happens and i think if you work for someone who is driven so heavily by their ego it is such a red flag because who they are and what they prioritize and what they stand for can change any sing any given day with whatever suits their narrative or suits their ego at the time and so working for someone like that is really hard because one day you could be really beneficial to them and the next you could just be discarded and they don't see value in you anymore because it doesn't fit their own narratives it doesn't fit their own ego and so there's just so much of a disconnect and, and it makes me sad but anyways red flag <laughs> I also think it's important in this discussion as we are identifying potentially more red flags. You know, like I said at the beginning of the video, what's a red flag to me might not identify as a red flag to you and that's totally okay. But a lot of the times when people do move into positions of management, into positions of, you know, being a boss, it's not always expected. And sometimes people don't actually want those jobs. They're just put into those roles and they don't have necessarily, or they're not equipped to develop their management skills. I think sometimes skills go into like the more hard skills, but not so much the skills of managing people and working with people. And not everyone has the training, but also not the desire to manage people. It's just the company puts them in that position and they don't really give them an option. I would say, you know, 70% of frontline managers, this, these are some stats I pulled, said they weren't expecting the promotion into leadership. And while 20% were excited about this new opportunity, 17% only took the role because it seemed like the right next step for their careers. Oh gosh, I go on a tangent here of just like what we're told we should want in a career and what like a good progression is and what we should aim and strive to be without actually taking a second to be like, well, what do I actually want? Oh my gosh, I can do a whole video on that. Anyways, an additional 19% of the study simply took it for the pay raise. They're like, oh, more money, yeah, that's fine, I'll take it and fair, I mean, that's a valid reason. Unfortunately, 18% of leaders also regret taking the role and another 41% have doubts about whether or not it was the right move. So I mean, hindsight is 20-20, right? Sometimes you don't know you don't wanna be a manager or a people manager until you are one. And then it can be challenged, challenging to go backwards in that. And so I would say if you are someone that's potentially considering wanting to be a leader, wanting to be a manager, invest in understanding a little bit more about what that means or what kind of management style you have and then take time to start to learn what kind of worker pe workers people are. I know when I first became a people leader, I, I had a basically sit down of my team to be like, what kind of workers are these individuals? And I had one-on-ones with them to kind of understand their goals, where they felt like the work that they were doing, they were they had the skill for versus what they kind of lacked the skill for versus what they were passionate about, like what they cared to do, what parts of their job description they were really interested in, what things were kind of like really mundane and while they still might be part of the job, they just like weren't overly motivated to do it. So understanding even things like communication preferences, like I know some of my team hates being messaged, you know, uh, like direct message during the workday, they just prefer everything in an email so that they can allocate time to it later to get to it. And then I know some members, just, emails are just like not their thing. They prefer just a phone call or a quick meeting to kind of catch up one-on-one. -on -one. So there's so many different things that go into making an effective leader. And I think it's also to important to remember you're not gonna please everyone. You're not gonna be for everyone. Your management style is not gonna be for everyone. That's also all right. But I didn't wanna leave this, this video on a negative because sometimes when I, I'm talking about red flags, I'm like, oh, this is feeling a little bit too negative for me. Well, I think it's important to identify things that might not serve us. Um, it's also important to identify things that do serve us, which is why I also created a green flags in managers. So if you haven't go watch that, feel free to go watch that, calling out some behaviors that I've seen throughout my career and my experience that I really admired and kind of helped shaped how I viewed management and things that I wanted to carry into 
my leadership position one day. So as always, I appreciate you being here. I'm checking my notes to see if I missed anything. I don't think I have. Lovely, lovely, lovely. And that's all I have for you. If you have more red flags, things you've seen that have caused a really unhealthy work environment, things that you just haven't jived with, within your own managers, within your own leaders, maybe some stuff that you really have seen that you really admire, drop it in the comment section. I love reading through them. I love hearing experiences from you all within your careers, within your professional lives. And so we'll leave it at that work, besties. Thank you for being here as always, and we'll see you in the next video. Toodaloo.